by folks. We're just giving a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in before we get started with tonight's event. If you are already logged into tonight's webinar with us, uh, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to purchase books by tonight's featured authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea with From Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Grace and Cho presenting her new book, Tastes Like War. She'll be talking with Sun Young Shin, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Grace, Sun Young, and the team at Feminist Press for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. You can also click the raise hand button and during the Q&A we can unmute your audio so you can ask a question to the author out loud. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Tastes Like War, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week. And you can purchase Grace's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pick up the at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. Grace has stopped by our store to sign copies of the book, so you can get a signed book by request while supplies last. Make sure to indicate your signed copy request and order comments at checkout when ordering online, or look for signed copies when you visit the store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Sun Young Shin. She is a poet, writer, cultural worker, and craniosacral therapist residing in Minneapolis, situated on Dakota homelands. She and fellow Korean immigrant poet Su Hong co-direct Poetry Asylum. Sun Young is the author or editor of nine books of poetry and prose. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Grace M. Cho. She is the author of Haunting the Korean Diaspora, Shame, Secrecy, and the Forgotten War, which received a 2010 book award from the American Sociological Association. Her writings have appeared in journals such as The New Inquiry, Poem, Memoir, Story, Context, Gastronomica, Feminist Studies, WSQ, and Qualitative Inquiry. She's Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. Her new memoir, Tastes Like War, is a hybrid text about a daughter's search through intimate and global history, the roots of her mother's schizophrenia. Grace is going to start us off with a reading from the book, 
and then she'll be talking with Sun Young and with all of you. Grace, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chelsea. I, it's really exciting for me to be here because um, Greenlight is my neighborhood bookstore. I've been going there for as long as it's been in existence. Um, and I, I wanted to thank Greenlight and also Feminist Press because it was really just amazing to work with Feminist Press. Um, and I, I wanna thank you guys again for encouraging me to put this story out there. Um, and Sun Yang, I'm although I'm so over Zoom as we all are, it's enabling you to be here with me from Minneapolis. So that's really exciting. And I, for, for the audience, Sun Yang and I go back to 2007. We met when we were traveling together in Korea with a group of activists. And I think we've only seen each other once since then in person. So this is sort of a, a nice reunion and I really appreciate that. Um, so I wanna give you a little bit of context about the book before I do the reading. As Chelsea mentioned, it's a hybrid text. So I describe it as part food memoir, part sociological investigation for the social roots of my mother's schizophrenia. Um, and I locate those roots in a few different places. One is in the Korean War. Um, another is in the sexual service economy that sprung up around the US bases after, during and after the war in which my mother worked. Um, and then the, the third place is in the immigration experience that my family had moving to a xenophobic small town in rural Washington state. Um, so this project of trying to understand my mother's mental illness really goes back a long ways. It goes back to 1998 when I entered my doctoral program. Um, and that was also the beginning of researching my first book, Haunting the Korean Diaspora. Um, and during the 10 years that I was doing that research, I was also my mother's cook, because at that point, her mental illness had become so severe, she could no longer cook for herself. Um, but what happened during that time was that I discovered that cooking for her was actually just as important a part of my education about the past. Um, as was my doctoral program. And so um, I worked on this, my first book for 10 years. In 2008, it was about to come out. And just as the book was in production, my mother suddenly died of an unknown cause. Um, and so I actually had not planned on writing another book about her, but immediately after her death, all of these memories came rushing back to me. Um, and they were memories of the first mother that I had, that mother that I had before she became mentally ill. Um, and so in the foreground of all those memories were these images of food, right? So either she was cooking, she was feeding people, she was foraging. Um, and so I immediately started to write again to try to capture those childhood memories because um, if I didn't, I felt like I was going to lose her again, right? So it was like, it was as if the grief allowed me to recover that first mother. And so initially this writing project did not begin with any intention of becoming a memoir, um, but it eventually did. And so in sort of reflecting on all of these food memories that came back to me, I was able to see how she used food in these very creative and resourceful ways, um, but also she used food in ways that were absolutely necessary to her survival. So the first few pieces that I wrote for this memoir really speak to that, about those food memories and how they were so integral to her survival. Um, so I'm gonna read an excerpt from one of those chapters and it is called Kimchi Blues. New York City, 2008. A week after my mother died, I stopped at a grocery store in Manhattan's Koreatown and bought a jar of kimchi. I didn't give it much thought at first. It was just an instinct. Stopping at that market on my way to Penn Station where I'd catch the Northeast Corridor line to her house had become a weekly habit during the 10 years that she lived in New Jersey. When I left the store that day, I meant to get on the downtown Q train that would take me home but instead I walked right past it and had almost arrived at Penn Station before I remembered that my mother had died. I stopped in the middle of the sidewalk on 32nd Street, blocking the flow of foot traffic as throngs of tourists and commuters pushed past me. 
I peered into my shopping bag as a jar of kimchi and watched dark spots spread across the brown paper where my tears hit the bag. Why did I buy this? She's not here to eat it with me. I don't even like kimchi that much. The kimchi sat in my fridge for weeks, swimming in a sea of garlic and chili, its odors slowly permeating all my other foods as it fermented. Everything I ate vaguely tasted of it, reminding me that my mother was gone. The first time I opened the tall glass jar, the smell hit me so hard that waves of grief rose up through my chest and into my throat until my body gave into its weight and I was sobbing over the kitchen sink. Every couple of days, I forced myself to eat some kimchi with my rice or ramen, tasting its transformation from the garlicky crunch of fresh cabbage to the pungent tang of soft ripe kimchi, the whole life cycle on my palate. By the time I ate my way through the jar, something shifted in my consciousness, and I went back to Hanarum to buy some more. I contemplated the orderly rows of kimchi in all their varieties, garlic chive, oyster, radish, cucumber, scallion, and the classic Napa cabbage before selecting a quart of the classic mat kimchi. Remember, I said to myself, this time I knew full well she was dead. It wasn't until I was assigned the family tree project at the age of nine, the same age as my mother when she became a refugee, that I began to understand that she had survived a war. She didn't utter another word about the war for at least 10 years, and my curiosity about all the things left unsaid was a seed in my unconscious. In the absence of her storytelling, I dedicated years of my adult life to researching civilian experiences. Some of the survivors who were children at the time came out a generation later to tell horrific tales of seeking refuge under piles of corpses during ground attacks, wading through rivers of the dead to search for their parents' remains, and watching helplessly as the people around them got dismembered by bombs. My mother couldn't bear to talk about the things she might have witnessed. The first time she ever volunteered a memory of the war, she told me a story about kimchi. As the battle lines moved southward, families were forced to flee their homes. People were starving, but they got by on foraging and looting the homes and fields of other displaced families. Occasionally, they received gifts of food from American soldiers. I was never really sure if I understood the facts of my mother's experience or if she herself remembered them correctly. But once she told me that when they were on the run, moving with hordes of other refugees, she became separated from her family. Somehow she made her way back to her family's home and then she remembered the big earthenware jars of kimchi that my grandmother had buried in the backyard. There was also some rice left in the pantry. She dug up a jar, set aside a ration of kimchi and boiled a pot of rice, eating just enough to quell her hunger, but not so much as to squander the kimchi. At the age of nine, my mother carried on like this week after week while she waited for her family to return. That kimchi kept me alive for almost three seasons. I might not have survived without it. After the war, the places that offered the best hope for survival were American military bases because that's where wealth was concentrated in Korea. And so my mother went there her longing for America carefully cultivated by the social and historical context in which she came of age. She was captivated by the images of the United States that she saw in the movies and came to associate all things American with luxury. She did not anticipate that in a country of such riches, she might one day starve. So in the rest of the chapter, I sort of explore this idea of starvation um, because it's not just the physical starvation, but the spiritual starvation as well. So this, it, it sort of goes on to talk about how when we moved to this town in Chehalis, Washington, um, this rural xenophobic town that had no Koreans, um, no Korean food, it was really a struggle for my mother. Um, she spent a lot of energy searching for those Korean foods. And so she would drive to cities all over the state in search of Napa cabbage to be able to make kimchi. Um, 
And, you know, we were the first Koreans to arrive there. And slowly over time, a few more started to come in. And so my mother sort of took on this role of feeding the other Koreans who came and making kimchi each time another Korean arrived. And all of the Koreans in my hometown were either mixed race families like mine, or they were Korean adoptees. And so she took on this role of um, making kimchi for all the Korean kids, because it was something that the, the adopted families had no capacity to do. Um, and so, you know, by observing the way that she did this, I saw how she was, she was trying to create this, these social connections, not just for those, the new people, but for herself, because I think that the starvation wasn't just about deprivation of the food, but it was also about deprivation of having contact with other Korean people and having lost one's culture and family from home. Sanya, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if you wanna respond. Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm, I, I'm thinking about the, the, what must have been the profound loneliness of these different women of different generations coming over as um, wives of American military and thinking about, you know, as, as someone who spent most of my life in the US, like being lonely, yeah, being lonely as, an, as um, someone who's so Americanized. But I guess think, yeah, thinking about the ways that your mother and other women like her really, like the word kind of terraform comes to mind. Like she just, she was such an incredible force and, I love the way that your book gives us such incredible detail about all of that. And um, I'm wondering, I have so many questions. I, so, so beloved um, attendants, attendees, I sent, I sent Grace 12 questions, but I really have like 50 questions and I, I'm, um, well, first but <laughs> um i mean another thought came to me though that i meant to say about that keep trip so there were there were two moments in my life when i realized the sort of kinship that mixed race koreans have with korean adoptees mm -hmm. and so one was during my childhood when i saw that we were the families that kept coming to this town and the way that my mother sort of um, took these children under her wing or took the new Korean bride under her wing, that we were sort of the marginalized within the community. Um, but I didn't understand until I became an adult how we were also the marginalized in Korea. Mm -hmm. And I think that one moment that really solidified that understanding for me was during our trip to Korea. So back when I met Sanyang in 2007, and we were traveling um, to various locations, meeting with activist groups there. I think we had gone to um, Durebang that day. Mm -hmm. And so we met with an organization that worked with military sex workers. And I remember afterwards, I looked at you and you were crying. And you said um, something about how this was your history. Mm -hmm. And it, it like was a revelation for me because I had thought, oh, I thought this was just my history. I didn't realize this was also her history. And so I think in my adult life, that's when I started to understand the kind of kinship that Korean adoptees and mixed race Korean people had because we both come out of the same legacy of militarization. And so that's another place that I go in that particular chapter that I just read from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that so well. And also, you know, other times that I've, I've been in Korea five times now since leaving as a toddler, um, you know, seeing military, American military servicemen and Korean women, you know, walking around hand in hand around bases and just having this incredible 
um, kind of time, yeah, time travel stuck in time. And even obviously each, each relationship is, is this individual thing, but in terms of just the kind of tableau of it, um, yeah, and that trip also really solidified for me, right? Just, yeah, this lineage and this really direct line. And so when I was reading your book, seeing that you had Korean adoptees in your life, and then there was a 16 or 17 year old adopt, like who'd been adopted at 16 yeah. or 17, I just, that's to me uncanny that they were part of your childhood as well in, in this tiny town. And do you have any idea how they got there? Was there a particular church or something? I mean, not that. Well, you know, they, I don't know if it was a particular church. I don't think, I don't even recall there being um, that many churches in the town yeah. where I grew up yeah. and it was just church, you know? I mean, I guess there must have been, um, a lot of them were adopted by the same family. So I think it was really just two families that were, yeah. that had adopted all of the ch Korean children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, this is a this is kind of a food question, but um, since you started with kimchi, and uh, you know, kimchi was something that my adoptive mother would buy for me from the Chicago, you know, Chicago small Koreatown stores, and I, you know, it's just it's not something that a kid, like an Amer American kid, is going to just like, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, it's just it speaks to um you know what I grew up eating or being around or be you know just as a one-year-old but now that that kimchi is so trendy I mean how you know how has, have you kind of followed just um the evolution of kimchi in in America is that something that you know you've thought about or is it like uh, I just don't have time to think about that <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I thought about it in any deep way. I, I've definitely noticed that it pops up everywhere, you know, in tacos and um, where else? I don't, I, I guess that's the most obvious one because there's like that kimchi taco truck. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I, I meet kids of many other ethnicities that are being introduced to kimchi. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I guess I'd, I'm, I'm not aware of it being popular outside of urban areas. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe and maybe it's Minnesota too, because of maybe because of the Korean adoptee population. And maybe in New York it doesn't feel bizarre because there's actual um, Korean, more Korean restaurants and things like that. But in, in the Twin Cities, kimchi is in like all kinds of restaurants. Uh, you know, there's just like a diner that has a kimchi hot dog, and then there's just um it's, yeah, it's just become kind of like, yeah, any place um, that has pickles is also going to have kimchi and. I mean, it is a great ingredient to cook with and plus it has probiotics. So since yeah, that's so trendy, people see it as yeah. this, this health food, but it's interesting because even though people are eating our food, they don't know anything about our history, right? right. Like, right. I mean, this, I, I chose to read that excerpt because this Friday marks the 71st anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Um, but most Americans still remain pretty ignorant about that war and the level of devastation that it killed 3 million civilians or 10% of the population of the peninsula. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that we can accept immigrants' food but still not really want to incorporate other aspects of our lives or, of, or you know, make any effort to try to understand the traumas that we bring. Right, right. I mean, that's the, that was part of, I mean, the quest for spice. You know, so it's just a continuation of this colonization process, um, global process. Do you, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about this. This wasn't one of my questions either, but, um, did it feel to you like the news stories about the Atlanta murders just disappeared really quickly? I mean, the news cycle is short, but it, to me, it, I don't know. I don't know if it was different in New York or um, in your did circles, but. Yeah, did the stories disappear really quickly? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think so, yes. That is also my perception of it. But as you said, I, 
I think that the new cycle is it's just too too fast paced. Um, however, I think that it did shift something in the way that we think about Asian American studies, um, mm. because people are now interested in in the, these histories, and I'm getting invitations to do interviews that all ask questions about how my work is related to, you know, what happened in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. I read that other interview where you talked about it a little bit. Um, how do you feel about, um, so I was mentioning before we went live that I, I noticed upon the second reading just how, how sort of, um, it felt luxurious to me that your book is so long. Mm -hmm. um, and I really love and treasure that, that it seems like you felt like you had space to really explore everything you wanted to under this theme or rubric. I mean, would you talk a little bit more about the process or process with the editor or how, you know, your, yeah, your book process? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, my editor was very generous in terms of allowing me to basically do what I wanted to do in ter terms of making it longer or making it shorter. I actually wanted it to be a little shorter. Um, mm -hmm. So we cut out a whole chapter that I felt didn't need to be there. Um, and then I had another chapter that I was considering using as the last chapter. But when I got to the end, when um, so when you read the last chapter, the last line, I definitely felt like that should be the end of the story. Um, and so I have this other chapter that appears sort of in other places, in pieces. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that you say it's luxuriously long because <laughs> it took me 12 years to write <laughs> so you know this I think that the process of writing these these memories um, and asking these questions about my family history but also these questions that sort of sort of challenge um, social conventions um, th they take a long time to unpack so it takes a long time to even formulate the question in my mind and to think about how I want to address it in a way that weaves it together with the story I'm telling about my mother. So, you know, I guess I had the luxury of 12 years to write the story and maybe that's why it feels like a long story. Um, and in fact, it is, it's epic, you know, it's like, I, I remember taking a, um, a memoir writing workshop where the teacher had a very strong opinion that when you write memoir, it should just be, she had this mantra, one place, one time. Mm -hmm. right? So that you shouldn't be moving around in time or place within the chapter of a memoir. I do exactly the opposite. So every chapter sort of goes all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. It encompasses this sort of epic history starting from, you know, long before I was born up until 2008 when my mom dies. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think that for an epic story like this, it's actually not that long. Um, but I appreciate you saying that it feels luxurious to read in that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do want people to sort of take their time reading it and, and to digest it because it's, it's dense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't mean academically dense, but just that there's a lot that happens and there, on an emotional level, there's a lot to unpack. Right, right. I mean, I think because I think of it as a sequel to your other book too. And um, I think because as a memoir, um, like as a sociological book, it doesn't seem long. And then as a, as a memoir, it seems, I mean, when I say long, but I'm, I like it, you know, not like overly long. Um, when I've read hundreds of memoirs, um, and collections of essays. And uh, I keep a list for my students when I'm teaching creative nonfiction, et cetera. And um, I think what your teacher said is, is right in a lot of cases because they're kind of following the uh, Aristotelian tragic, you know, the rule about tragedy that there's gonna be un unity of time, space and action. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be one storyline, and there's going to be, um, yeah. And I think that that also that's for a monocultural 
audience though. I mean, the only people who came to those performances, which were one-time performances, you know, those plays were only performed once at the festival for men, for citizens, you know, for and by men. Um, so we're just, to me, that just seems like a really um, strange, but maybe very like Western culture, yeah, uh, restriction. So I'm really glad you, you know, felt free to do what you needed to do. Yeah. Um, well, I had, uh, you know, I had a long history of doing that. So with my first book, I didn't really follow the convention, the sociological conventions either. Um, when I got to, when I started writing memoir, I was hoping that um, maybe I wouldn't be seen as so weird, you know, but I, I found there also there are gatekeepers of the genre. Um, sure. So then I just, you know, then after that experience, I kind of felt like, all right, well, I guess this is my thing then, you know, is that I'm just not gonna quite fit into any genre and I'll, we could just call all of my work hybrid in that sense. I mean, yeah, I love it. And I think that many writers of color and diasporic writers and, you know, queer writers, any writers whose, whose histories and languages have been marginalized are, you know, will, will press against or struggle with the kinds of constraints that the mm -hmm. industry has, has set. Um, did you write as a, did you, did you ever think, you know, growing up that you would become a writer? I know that your mother says like, I want you to be a scholar and you fulfilled that, but so many, I think girls, so many Americans of color don't grow up with role models, uh, yeah. writing role models or book models. Yeah, it's interesting because um, there's a scene in the book where I'm in junior high and Rebecca Brown, who was a writer from Seattle, came to my junior high to do a, a creative writing workshop. And um, based on that, I, I got this idea that I wanted to move to New York and become a writer. So it was a very early fantasy of mine mm -hmm. that I sustained until I got to college. Mm -hmm. And so then when I got to college, I had to um, submit a sample of my writing to get into a class and I was rejected. So I just took that as a sign. Uh, I was not supposed uh, to be here, you know? And, and uh, you know, I didn't know enough to question that or, um, so I just moved in this totally other direction. So I never imagined that I would be, you know, writing my first or publishing my first creative work at the age of 50. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, that yeah. It kind of blows my mind when I think about it. I know, I think about so many, you know, this kind of leads to, Another question that I had about the, the flood of memories you talked about and some of the really um, racist violence that you and your mother and family had to deal with that you include in different parts of the memoir. And I think, you know, for me and for so many people, I know so many of these childhood racist encounters are like very crystal clear, even if, the, you know, they may have been five seconds long or kind of one exchange with a teacher. Um, and I think that, you know, just even thinking about the white teachers I've taught with or who my students have said, what a white teacher said this one thing to them or friends 50 years later, they remember this one thing that this one white teacher said to them mm -hmm. about their, you know, kind of what their future should look like. Something limiting, something um, dehumanizing or yeah, low expectation, all kinds of things, right? And just, um, you said memories came flooding back after your mother died, but were some of those other things just you had held on to, or had you not thought about them since childhood, or how did those the come back to you? Yeah, the memories that came back were really of my my mother when I was young, before she became mentally ill, and how powerful she was, how charismatic she was, which I had completely forgotten because. Mm -hmm for so much of my life. I mean, my whole coming of age story is around learning how to live with her mental illness. Right. Um, and then going on to graduate school to study all of the violent forces that broke her down, <laughs> you know, the Korean War and everything that came afterwards. Um, so that flood of memories was, I mean, it, it was pure joy, actually. I mean, it, so, 
I did not have a flood of the kinds of memories that you're referring to because the, the painful racist memories from my childhood, I never forgot. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like as, as you were saying that you can just have this very brief moment with somebody and it just marks you forever. It just stays in your memory. Um, so yeah, um, it was almost as if, you know, like when my mom first became schizophrenic, I just wished so dearly to have the old mother back, you know? So for all of my teenage years and my twenties and even into my thirties, I, I had hope that maybe, maybe she would come back. And so it took her death to actually get that mother back because mm -hmm. the moment that she died, it all came back to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there was some, some you know, I don't know if it was repression or if it was just that all of the other stuff, all of the traumas that I was trying to process took up so much space in my mind that I, I couldn't, I just didn't have space to remember the other things. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, to everyone here who's here, please do put questions in the Q&A. We're collecting them for Grace and... Um, there's already two in there, which is great. And there's some chat. And um, I, I was really struck where you write about how one of the dishes you made for your mother, um, your friend Hosu, who I also know said, oh, that's how we, like, we don't make it that way anymore. That's how we made it in the 50s or 60s. And, you know, how you were making all these things that, of course, from your mother's childhood or her early, um, early adulthood. And, and how does that, how does that, how has that affected how you feel about, I don't know, cooking Korean food now, or your orientation toward Korea, South Korea now, which continues to just change so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I think in some ways it's a very typical immigrant story. You know, I think about, you know, immigrants in New York who, not recent immigrants, but the ones who have been here a while, Mm -hmm. The food that they make is not the same food that's in their home countries now, because, right. you know, if you, if you leave the place in the, you know, the seventies or eighties and you continue to cook what you think is that cuisine, mm -hmm. it is a certain version of it, but it's sort of the, a time capsule of it. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, cuisine in South Korea has changed quite a lot. It doesn't resemble the food that I, um, that I learned to cook from my mom mm -hmm. at, at that much. Right. Mm -hmm. And the foods that she taught me to cook were not the foods that she cooked for me during my childhood. Uh, so it's yeah. really, right. really old-fashioned. I mean, this was the food um, that my grandmother cooked for her when she was a child, right? And so that was sort of this, this archive of recipes that I inherited because of my mother's mental illness. And I think had it not been for that, I would never have, um, I would never have learned to cook those foods. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's that scene in the book where Hosu just bursts out laughing when I told her what I cooked. And I think it wasn't just that they don't cook it that way anymore. It's just nobody cooks that anymore. That's like such an old school dish. Nobody, nobody makes that. It's going to come back. I mean, yeah. you know, things come back. Yeah, and oh. it's, it's delicious. I mean, I cook it for my family now. So this is also yeah. what my, my son thinks is Korean oh. food. It's this really old fashioned food. That's, yeah. that's so beautiful. Um, I kind of like, oh, these questions are so juicy. Um, maybe we should go into them now, even because I feel like I'm hogging all the questions. Um, what do you think? Do you, you can see them, right? Do you want to, do you want to pick some of these Q and A questions? Let's see. That's a lot. I think some of these, maybe these denser questions, uh, maybe people want to unmute and talk through them a little bit. I love that. Yeah. I, I can, I can, um, I can answer this one about foraging. Oh, hi, Angela. <laughs> so Angela was in a is was in the first memoir workshop I ever took in New York. She is an incredible writer. Yes. And, uh, yeah. This and oh my gosh. Angela remembers the submission I had then, which was you know an early version of Madame Mushroom about the foraging. Um, 
Lorelei Williams, do you do you mind? Do you want to read your your question? It's really yeah. If folks want to ask their questions aloud, uh, you can hit the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we can unmute you so you can talk to Grace and Sonia. Or are you in a very noisy house? Okay. Let's see. So, I can ask Laura's question out loud here. Um, she says, lately I am coming across, or perhaps I'm looking for them unconsciously, many books about immigrant identity slash family and food, like Crying in H Mart, Some Are Always Hungry, Peach State, Arborine. Could you talk more about this connection between food and immigrant identity, especially as the one and a half or second generations look back on the food relationship with parents? What does exploring this identity and relationship through or with food give us access to or open up? Well, I'm first, I think I'm first going to answer that as a sociologist, right? Like sociologists look at immigration in relation to um, assimilation, right? Like they still use this term. And um, the last thing to go, the last thing that an immigrant loses is their food culture. And so I think that it is something that's really salient. Um, because even if you have, like me, lost your language, I have lost so much of the Korean language that I had as a child, um, the food is something that still is able to bridge that, that, uh, that gap to the home, to the, you know, the mother's culture. Um, and of course, like in my, in my memoir, all of those meals that I cooked with my mom, all of them were opportunities to create some sort of opening to the past, you know? So the, the meals sort of set the stage um, and created the conditions for that to happen. And it didn't happen immediately, it happened after doing it over and over and over again. And that there was something about the act of, of feeding, um, cooking, sharing food, you know, my, my mother teaching me the recipes. She did it in a very unusual way, which was that she didn't get up off the couch because her voices told her not to move too much. So she would just sort of call out the instructions to me from the other room and sort of imagine the steps that I was taking. Um, so she sort of passed on these recipes to me in this very unusual way. Um, but this, it was a sort of like um, interchange between the two of us um, where she was transmitting something of the past and, the, and her culture to me in ways that I didn't get as a child. Right, that was only something that I got through my adulthood. And so I think that food in the immigrant experience is really powerful because it's something that preserves the connection to what you have lost when you leave your family and your country behind, right? Or as a second generation, when you don't have access to that because you're here and not there or because you can't speak the language. So, so the food can become a kind of language that you share. Sanyang, I know you have also written about food and you edited a new volume about food. I don't know if you want to add something to that. I did, but I I just want to talk about your book. But people, <laughs> I mean, would have, right. you know, if people want to check it out, it's because I edited these amazing essays by other refugee and immigrant writers that I, I wanted to hear from and yeah, have more of these conversations kind of amongst, our, amongst ourselves, but for everyone, but also just without... Um, yeah, without the white lens or without kind of the celebrity chef lens or those other kinds of things. Um, I was really inspired by Jung Kwan um, and the episode about her on Chef's Table. But um, let's see, let's, let, uh, do you mind answering Lorelei's question? They said I could read it and then there's- um, Should we go ahead and read it? Yeah, could, so she asked, could you speak more about the Korean mothers who were broken by the cycles of oppression? There are those of us whose mothers became abusive because of what they went through. They were raised solely by white fathers and perhaps stepmothers from other nations given the fetishization of foreign women by white men. 
I'm curious how that came up in your work and research as this was also not an archetype really explored in hunting the Korean diaspora. Also completely understand if this question is too heavy. Thank you for your vulnerability and openness. Thank you, Lorelai. Um, the question is not too heavy, but I will say that I did not really come across this archetype in my research um, because I was drawing on work that was already published. I did not do secondary, I mean, I did not do primary research to seek out these families and interview the women. I was relying on the secondary research. Um, and so I just didn't really um, find that example so much. So I think what you're pointing to is a gap in that research that um, currently exists that somebody needs to, somebody needs to uh, pick that up and, and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add briefly that that question is so, seems it's so salient for Korean adoptees, at least in my just anecdotal experience with some who I, I know who have found their Korean mothers who have met their um, half siblings. And in some cases, those Korean mothers remarried white men um, and were um, abusive mothers to, the, uh, to their others, to the children they did raise. And so it is complicated and there is a lot of trauma and it isn't something that um, we have made space for or for healing you know, this intergenerational trauma. So thank you for that question. So I, I actually had started to address Angela. So maybe we could go back to that. Um, so Angela asked me to talk more about the foraging part of the memoir, your mother foraging in the small xenophobic US town. I remember that so vividly from one of your submissions in a memoir workshop that was quite memorable, powerful. Um, yeah, so I have a chapter in the book called Madame Mushroom. Um, so it was sometime in the like late 70s, early 80s when my mom began to forage, which she originally did as a pastime. So there was some wilderness where I grew up. She would go out into the woods, initially just looking for things to eat, to feed the family. Um, but then she came across a blackberry patch and realized that she had a business opportunity. And so literally overnight, our house was completely filled with blackberries because she would, she just became so obsessed with blackberries. And so she would go out there every single day, fill up the car with blackberries, come home, um, clean them, bag them freeze them and she put in an ad in the paper to sell them. And so suddenly our house sort of became this, this place for black bear commerce. And then for each season, she would sort of seek out what was growing in the forest. And she did the same with mushrooms. Um, she sold them to a regional distributor called Madame Mushroom. Tens of thousands of pounds of just of chanterelle mushrooms, as she told me, tens of thousands of pounds. Um, and of course, as a child, you know, when these things happen during your childhood, you sort of take it for granted. But then later, as, as an adult, um, I realized that she was really powerful in her ability to do this. Like she had tremendous knowledge and capacity. Um, and she also was feeding this community that had really rejected her and committed violence against her. Um, and so it was this way of sort of like, turning the tables in a way um, and, and reclaiming her own power. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for bringing up that chapter. I can't believe you remember it after all these years. It's an extraordinary, I mean, she was an extraordinary human being. Um, and that chapter is really beautiful too. Yeah, thank you. So Jihyun's question, how can you say hope? Um, to the Korean diaspora who have lived with transgenerational trauma, the ongoing effects of those transmitted traumatic wounds. Where do you find hope or resilience? If you'd like to answer that one. So I don't think of trauma as just something that's, that's pathological or wounding. You know, for me, it's also a source 
a source of strength and power because it is, it's sort of like the driver of memory, right? Because who would remember these stories? Who would remember the stories of our, of our families? Who would remember the stories of um, Korean civilians who were lost in the war if we did not carry forward this trauma with us? So I don't think of trans, transgenerational trauma um, as a pathology, but I think of it as a force of memory. And it's been really powerful in generating um, like a whole generation's worth of literature and cultural production, right? So you know, not just not just the writings that we've done, but you know, we have all of these filmmakers who have sort of come out of that tradition as well. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, I don't mean to dismiss any sort of real psychic pain that people have, but I, I guess what I want to suggest is that we can use use that psychic pain as a generative force as well, um, so that so that the trauma itself might also be the resolution for the trauma if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if you know Ann Jinsu, but she's here in Minneapolis. Um, so she asks, as you experimented with cooking, baking, and hosting pop-ups, how much of that was influenced or inspired by your history with your mom and your role cooking for your mother? Well, let's say um, it was inspired by my <laughs> my desire to rebel against her orders that I not be a cook. <laughs> so that you know, there's a there's a chapter in the book where um, you know the first scene is her my mom asking me what I want to be when I grow up, and I say a cook, and she flips out and says, "No, you you will never be a cook. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, or a professor." Um, and so I think that. I always had the sort of transgressive desire to do this thing that she said I shouldn't do. Um, so initially, the when I started baking, it it was sort of in defiance of her, and I don't think it was a conscious defiance. I think it was just that maybe I enjoyed it a little bit more because I had never been allowed to do it. So it also sort of represented a kind of freedom and independence. Um, but eventually I started to incorporate Korean dishes into some of those, um, the, the pop-ups that, that um, Anne is referring to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't do a lot of cooking professionally or even as a, as a hobby anymore. I think the pandemic has just turned it into drudgery for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's that aspect of choice as, as opposed to generations of women all over you know, who have to cook every day for many people and it is what they have to, you know, that is yeah. what they have to do. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Allie H asks, what made you pick up your pen later and write even after the, not getting into that first workshop? I only started to write um, after I realized that the, that I was carrying the traumas of my family. And it was sort of a way of working through that. And I think that the point at which I started to write these things, um, I didn't feel like it was a choice so much, but it was more that I was driven to do it, you know? And so, um, you know, I think that's going back to the, the previous question about where do you find hope in mm -hmm. relation to all of these traumas? Mm -hmm. um, because the act of writing, even though, well, I, I don't want to say the act of writing, but writing specifically about the the traumatic legacies that we live with as part of the Korean diaspora. Um, that's something that gives me hope because as I'm doing the writing, it is a really powerful, effective experience that is um, cathartic and, and um, generative at the same time, where I feel like it's leading towards something, towards something else. You know, and so I just sort of feel it in, in my body that it, it, you know, that it's, um, it's not the kind of pain that's going to destroy me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I think I've always sort of been driven to do the writing as a way of confronting my family history. Right. Making sense of it. Um... Jennifer Kwan Dobbs has a question in the chat oh, yeah. um, that is really lovely. I think, can you talk about your mother as a reader of nature? 
Um, I love that question, yeah, because, um, well, as, as you know, Jennifer, she was not literate in any um, conventional sense. So I love that you framed it in terms of reading nature. Um, you know, and I think you had said to me before that she, that she had this knowledge of the forest floor, right? And so when she first started to forage, and especially when it was with the mushrooms, you know, you have to educate yourself quite a lot about mushrooms because otherwise you might end up eating some poisonous mushrooms. Um, but she did it, she did it very well and that she was able to just in a split second sort of look at what was on the forest floor and identify things that were poisonous, things that were edible, that to an untrained eye, it would, you wouldn't see anything at all, right? Um, and so, yeah, she was a reader of the forest and even years, decades after she stopped going out into the forest because she had become a, a shut-in for much of her life Sometimes you would still sort of see that, that look of hunger in her eyes when she looked outside, you know, at the trees in the distance, imagining what was there. So even, you know, like I have this moment in, the, in that, that chapter, Madame Mushroom, where she's doing just that, but she schooled herself about the forest in um, Washington state where I grew up. And when she's looking out the window, that was happening in the Northeast, which has totally different trees. Yet she remembered enough about the mushrooms to recognize that there were some of the same mushrooms from the Pacific Northwest that are in the Northeast too, by recognizing the trees. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, was it a, was it a difficult decision or, uh, or not to not include recipes? And she's asking about, you know, that's kind of another rule or expectation in food memoir writing. And yeah. it was not, no, it was not a difficult decision <laughs> to not include them um, for a couple of reasons. One, because I feel like I've seen it enough times that I didn't, you know, like, I don't know, I didn't really want to do another book that had recipes, but also because I don't have any written recipes. It was all sort of through this oral, this oral tradition of, um, telling me not to be ashamed to use sesame oil. That's, that was her way of saying, use a lot of sesame oil, right? Um, so I, you know, like the, the work of trying to translate that and write it down for a reader who's not familiar with that way of hearing a recipe mm -hmm. also kind of feels like I am pandering to an audience that is not actually the audience I think that I'm engaged with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, and the other thing is that I, I didn't really feel the need to go full force with the food memoir, right? Because as some people have already noted, it's sort of a food memoir, but it doesn't exactly read like a food memoir, like in places it does, but in other places it doesn't. Um, so I didn't want to feel like I was confined to the limitations of that genre. Nice. Um, there's three more questions in the chat and do you, we have a, a, a minute, a couple minutes, a minute, one minute. Do you want to say, want to address any of those? Oh my gosh, I think about this Buddha Chige question <laughs> too. <laughs> um, but. So, well, there's a quick answer to the Buddha Chige which is that I wrote a piece on Pure Chige, so you can find it in Contexts Magazine. Nice. <laughs> when, and it also links to the trip that we took together in Korea. Um, and then Misha Goldberg, your books lay out the history and passing down of international trauma and intergenerational trauma in such a personal and creative way. Do you feel the process of writing and investigating has helped to short circuit and heal your, our transgenerational trauma? So I think that the more I do this, the more I have questions about what healing is, right? Because I think, yes, in some sense it does, in that it, you know, I feel more at ease being vulnerable, right? So I, you know, I think that typically people think of healing as being in a state that's free of pain, but I'm thinking of it more as being comfortable with vulnerability. Um, and so on a personal level, yes, but I think that on a collective level, I think we need to continue to do this because um, it's only through the disruption of 
sharing that trauma with others that we can change some of these oppressive structures. And then Claudio. When did you feel your mom went from being mother two, as you call her in your book, and became mother three, much closer to the mom you remembered from childhood? Was there a turning point? Was there a particular dish conversation? I don't know that I can pinpoint it exactly, but it definitely was once I started cooking for her. Um, there is a moment in the book, so if I had to choose one moment, it is the moment in the book when I make her a bowl of sogogi soup, which is a beef, a beef and radish soup. Um, and she says something to me, like, I, you know, I realize now that you love me. And I just broke down in tears because I couldn't believe that she thought that I didn't or that she had questioned it. Um, but it was this moment when she brought up this incident from my adolescence, when I called the police to try to get her psychiatric help because that's what they told me, what, what the mental health uh, counselor I saw told me to do. Um, and it was something that she didn't forgive me for for a really long time. And so, you know, beneath her sort of the facade of her, her schizophrenia, she was also angry at me. And so she was, you know, from the age 15 until then, which was about the time I was maybe 30-ish, she was kind of scary to me because I also knew that she was angry at me, but I didn't exactly understand why. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the turning point from mother two to mother three. I'm looking at you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Grace and Sun Young, for such a wonderful conversation. And thank you to all of you in the audience for coming out tonight and having such a wonderful conversation with Grace and Sun Young as well. Um, a reminder that you can buy Tastes Like War um, from Green Light Bookstore and linking that by link in the chat again. Uh, for local uh, in-store pickup if you're here in Brooklyn or for shipping anywhere in the US, there is the beautiful cover on Sun Young's video. Um, and we do still have a few signed copies in our Fort Greene store. So you can swing by there if you'd like to pick up a signed copy or if you're ordering online, you can just be sure to request in the order comments at checkout that you'd like a signed copy of the book. Uh, thank you all so much again for a wonderful evening and have a excellent rest of your night. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.